Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Growth Labs Development Talks seminar. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Farah Hani, and I will be moderating today's session with Dr. Razaz. Uh, just to start briefly about uh, the Development Talks, uh, the Growth Labs Development Talks is a series of conversations with policymakers and academics working in international development. Our aim is to provide a platform for practitioners and researchers to discuss both the practice of development and analytical work centered on policy. Um, for today's seminar, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Omar Razaz, uh, the former Prime Minister of Jordan, to discuss his experience and insights from managing policy reform in Jordan. We're, we're very honored to have you with us here today, Dr. Razaz. Welcome. Um, before I introduce Dr. Razaz for today, I would like to mention two things up front. Uh, the first thing is, if you want to stay up to date with the Growth Labs research events, uh, job opportunities, and more, you can visit our website, follow us on social media, and sign up to our quarterly newsletter. Uh, you can find more information at www.growthlab.cid.harvard.edu. Uh, and second, I'd like to invite you all to attend our next Development Talks seminar, which will take place on Wednesday, August 11th, featuring Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka from 2016 to 2019. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guest. Dr. Razaz is the former Prime Minister of Jordan, uh, his career is diverse and spans the public sector, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, think tanks, international organizations, and academia. Before becoming prime minister, Dr. Razaz held several positions in government and policy institutions in Jordan. He served as Jordan's Minister of Education between 2017 and 18, and he also was the Director General of Jordan's Social Security Corporation between 2006 and 2010. Dr. Razaz also served as the chairman of the board of directors of the Jordan Strategy Forum, which is a leading think tank on economic development in Jordan. He was also the chairman of Jordan's Ahli Bank. In addition to his work in Jordan, Dr. Razaz also worked in the World Bank in various positions and regions. Uh, he was the country manager of the World Bank in Lebanon between 2002 and 2006. And before that, Dr. Razaz was the Ford Chair Assistant Professor at MIT in the International Development and Regional Planning Program. Dr. Razaz holds a master's degree from, uh, in urban and regional planning from MIT and a PhD in planning from Harvard University with a minor in economics and is a postgraduate from the Harvard uh, Law School. Just before, before I hand it over to Dr. Razaz, who has some opening remarks, I want to uh, explain the format of today's session. Uh, Dr. Razaz will start with, with a presentation, uh, which will then be followed by a series of questions. After those questions, we will open up for Q&A from the Growth Lab team, uh, and finally open up for questions from the broader audience. I would like to remind you that if you have any question you'd like to ask Dr. Razaz, please type it in Zoom's Q&A box. Uh, and make sure to include your name uh, and affiliation, and we will uh, pass it over. So without uh, further uh, delay, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Razaz, for the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Farah. I'm uh, delighted uh, to be on Zoom with everybody and delighted to uh, associate with uh, Harvard faculty and students. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, of the good old days. Uh, but I envy you guys on one thing, you're able to switch off if, if, this, if the speaker is boring. So <laughs> we couldn't do that back then. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and I hope it's not boring. I've, uh, I was thinking about the audience, in fact, and I realized that this is a diverse group. Uh, there are some students who, are, uh, who know the Middle East and working on Jordan, but many who don't. Um, so it's sort of the introduction at least uh, assumes that you don't know much about Jordan and I'll make the introduction short and then we can go into deeper questions and I look really look forward to hearing from you as, as well because as you all know and I'm sure you're learning that it, there are so many sides to something and how you approach it so I'd, I'd be very interested in your feedback and your questions and your suggestions as, uh, 
as well. So let me try to um, start a short presentation. Here. Is that, do you see that? Is that coming across? Yes. Jordan? Yes. Good, good, good. And I chose this title because I feel it. I think we're going through it. And I hope you'll see why uh, this, the image of, of swimming against the tide, not even the current uh, in a turbulent re region applies uh, in this case. I'm gonna talk about country features for Jordan, uh, regional features, the neighborhood we live in, uh, resilience features of Jordan and where do we go from here and how do we uh, build on the experience that, that we've had. And finally, I'll end with global challenges and opportunities. I really won't be able to give uh, this item uh, its fair share, but I hope we can talk about it uh, in the discussion. It's something I'm very interested in. So starting with the country features, Jordan is a geographically small country um, mostly semi-arid land, limited natural resources. We do have though the, the Jordan Valley, which is a very lush um, um, uh, for agriculture and it's, it allows us to export early products uh, to, to Europe, um, agricultural products. Um, beyond that, uh, the, our real asset is our population. It's very well educated. Um, population um, and has really contributed to the production and productivity and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And very important in our part of the world, a stable political regime. We've just celebrated 100 years um, of uh, uh, the establishment of Jordan under the Hashemite monarchy and it's been very stable. Uh, uh, the monarch uh, giving the throne to the son and then to the grandson, etc. in that process and in many ways, in many ways, uh, unique uh, to this region. And if you look at the indicators, uh, uh, whether they're social, economic, political, governance, what have you, Jordan fares relatively well. In fact, above average in most uh, indicators for lower income uh, or lower middle income uh, countries. And that's where Jordan sits in terms of its uh, categorization. So that's a quick, uh, a, a, a quick sort of introduction of Jordan, where it is and what it is. But if you start looking at the map in front of you, um, Israel and the West Bank to the, to the West, Syria to the North, Iraq to the East, Saudi Arabia to the South, already you can see what sort of a troubled uh, neighborhood we're talking about. And there is very little you can do to stop some forms of contagion as we will see from, from neighborhood um, effects. So what does a small country uh, with uh, surrounding like this do? How do, you, how do you approach development? How do you approach growth? Usually the standard answer for small countries with small markets is you really have to focus on, on exports, exports of goods and services because your local market is not a good place to start, it's too small. And that's, you can see the challenge um, already and I'll, I'll go through it uh, right there. Okay, so we've seen Jordan. Now what you're seeing is the state uh, uh, fragility in the Middle East. There is this indi indicator of state fragility all over the world and countries in the world are ranged from blue, which is very stable, uh, to red, is, is, dark red essentially, uh, failed states. Uh, and then there are degrees of fragility. As you can see, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, much of North Africa, is uh, shades of red, shades of uh, orange. Uh, and, um, and that's a big problem for our region. Uh, Jordan is yellow, so better than most uh, countries in, in the region in terms of fragility, and they measure that. We can go into how they measure that. It's there on, the, on their website. Um, but much of the Western world, of course, and Eastern world is, is in the, 
is the other side of the spectrum, sort of yellow, green, and dark green, and then, and then blue. So what does this mean uh, for us? Well, as we said, uh, it's a fragile region all over with uh, spillover effects of all sorts of uh, uh, features. Um, to our south, as you can see, this yellow block is the oil uh, rich countries. And in some ways, this is good uh, for Jordan, but in many ways, it isn't. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, brain drain from Jordan over the last 40, 50 years. The most creative, if you want, the creative class uh, of, of technicians, engineers, uh, uh, doctors, uh, business people have been attracted um, to, to that part, which is fine, but it does affect um, Jordan, they send remittances, but it does affect Jordan in negative ways in terms of growth. And there's been a lot of literature on the, of, of the sort of when the skilled and highly skilled populations of a country are attracted outside of it, what that happens. Um, again, the other factor is oil rich countries can heavily subsidize their um, products uh, through oil price uh, to uh, uh, yeah, um, energy prices, etc., and it becomes hard for Jordan to ex export to the south uh, because it's competing with um, with heavily subsidized products. And then to our west uh, occupied territories, Israel and the West Bank, and um, and and that's a, a big problem as as well, not just. Uh, politically, uh, as as we all know, with with and we've just seen violence flare about a month ago, um, and lack of address to the Palestinian uh, needs and rights. But even economically, Israel tries to limit uh, Jordan's exports and trade with with the West Bank um, through various means, and that makes trade to the West as difficult as well. So, what does Jordan do at a at this region le level, what has its role been? Um, King Abdullah was was there just last week, and if anybody followed aspects of of his discussion with President Biden, it's about regional stability. Let's bring stability to the region. Let's build bridges. Let's uh, end wars. Let's find ways for the people of the region to um, to kind of find hope. Uh, let's. Um, Let's find a break into this stalemate in the in the Israeli-Palestinian process and uh, give Palestinians some hope of a state of their own. So um, that's what Jordan has been doing, trying to find uh, bridges between countries and and ways to um, to to um, find solutions to the many problems that. Uh, and, and wars and conflicts that are in the region. So we tend not to play partisan roles on the regional level. We tend to stay out of it a little bit, maybe like Switzerland, maybe in Europe in the um, uh, in, in the in the forties and and fifties. So uh, so that's the regional uh, world that uh, that the region neat nature that we live in. Um, and I'd like to just. I refer very quickly to the features of resilience that we've had. I mean, if you can just imagine between 2010 to 2020, what has happened. So we start 2010 with the end of the global financial crisis, right? Uh, and that was a global feature. Everybody suffered and Jordan suffered heavily from that, especially in foreign direct investment. Um, and so we start a decade of external shocks. So you start with that. Then right after the Arab Spring begins in 2011 from Tunisia and then spreads uh, everywhere. And that, of course, is a shock in, it, in itself to, to the region. And then uh, we were the only gas supply we had was from Egypt uh, at that time. And it fueled our uh, power generation facilities. So that was interrupted for three, I think, even four years. And the cost on our energy bill was incredible. It was about $7.5 billion, I think almost like 15, 20% of, of, of GDP for that whole period. So really significant uh, increase in, in oil uh, prices. And then the Syrian refugees, 1.3 million uh, moved to Jordan. 
uh, within a couple of years, putting tremendous pressure on the infrastructure, health and education. But we, Jordan, welcomed them with uh, open arms because these were mostly women and children. Uh, the, fight, the men were fighting uh, the war, but it was really a humanitarian issue um, that Jordan had to uh, uh, deal with. Um, but in a sense, 20% of Jordan's population, 1.3 million is that. Is, is, is that. So, um, and then the Iraq uh, war with ISIS spread to the eastern borders. We had to close our borders in 2014, et cetera. So can you just imagine what uh, within five years, uh, uh, the, the impact of that politically, socially, economically um, on Jordan, it was quite a, um, a, a heavy burden, I guess, to, uh, to deal with. And in spite of all that, we've had continued political stability, and we can talk more about that, how that is measured, and I'll show uh, a slide on that. Uh, macroeconomic stability, there were so many monetary problems in the region, as, as, as you know, Jordan didn't, and um, our macro economy stayed stable, the fundamentals stayed stable. We've always had a fiscal um, uh, issue, a fiscal um, deficit problem, but it did not increase. In fact, towards 2018 and 19, we were in a, a program that was starting to close the, fisc uh, the fiscal deficit gradually and manage that. Uh, we increased exports. We couldn't export to Iraq, so we found we had the FDA agreements with the, uh, the EU, with the US, uh, with Canada, um, and with Singapore, and we started exporting outside uh, uh, the region. And the value added, a UNIDO report referred to the value added of Jordan exports being amongst the highest in the, in the region. So troubled region, um, but we've managed to stay alive, essentially, to swim against uh, the tide. And in 2018, 2019, we started uh, actually taking off in, in, all, in all our indicators. And by March, COVID hits of 2020. So again, uh, we have to deal with the, with the effects of that. I'll just share with you a few slides just so that we're not, um, um, I refer to data as opposed to just uh, talk. This uh, is the uh, worldwide governance indicators and um, the, what the lines you're looking at here, the dotted line is the Middle East and North Africa um, uh, average for voice and accountability. Um, voice and accountability are amongst the most important measures of governance and political stability. And, um, and there's a lot of literature and a lot of information, a lot of data, as, as you would expect on this issue. So I chose uh, the Middle East and looked at the different countries in the region. Um, the, or, this orange line here um, is Jordan. And you can see from 2010 to 2019, it's been essentially stable. Now, which is the other country in the whole region that has had similar um, sort of a similar cruising, let's say, uh, altitude is Morocco. So Jordan and Morocco have been kind of moving relatively uh, stable and above regional average, below the global average, just to be clear, uh, but on a regional basis. Now, you can compare countries like Tunis, Tunisia, which have, after 2011, jumped on four, upwards on the um, voice and accountability. But um, um, so on the political side, they did well for quite a while. But those of you who are following the news, has been many governments replaced. Now there is no government and there is a conflict. So the political process is, has kind of, is uh, uncertain, let's put it this way. And a number of countries militarized and moved down. And uh, there are several countries here that you can see have moved uh, down in terms of voice and accountability. Um, so stable politically in terms of voice and accountability. And when we look at, this is COVID, we decided to lock down very early in March 18th of 2020. We didn't know exactly what 
how COVID was going to uh, spread. So what did we do? We created a bubble in Jordan. And, and we focused, we kept industry, export industry going, but we really controlled our boundaries and our borders and, uh, and we did extremely well. So what this uh, uh, chart shows is the number of deaths per million in different countries of the world. And you can see here the first wave hitting many countries, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, um, um, United uh, Kingdom very strongly hardly affected Jordan at all uh, because we had this lockdown and we started to open smartly the sectors that either affect our exports or the living, you know, the essentials of, of, of human beings. Well, uh, but we did get the second wave, uh, still better than many other countries, but by the second wave we were prepared. We had built our infrastructure, our hospitals, our readiness, our clinics, our, vac our um, test kits and our vaccines. So by the time it did come, it was sort of lower than many other countries. And then now everybody's in this anticipation of the third wave, but we're, um, we're hoping that we could, um, we will be able to um, survive it and, and do well, because we're, we're well prepared at many levels. Um, just to give you a sense of the macro uh, story, after COVID, of course, uh, growth rates throughout the world went down, went negative. Uh, the United Kingdom was projected to go down by almost 10%, Tunisia 7%, Saudi Arabia 5.5%, Jordan by 5 the United States by 4.3%. These were the projections. Indeed, Jordan went down by 3% only. And that compares very fa favorably in real terms with, with, with other countries. So our growth didn't get affected as much. And now we're expecting 2% growth, which is not high, but it's sort of, in fact, uh, relatively low, but it's sort of consistent with what we see. Um, our debt increase, again, most countries' debt has increased substantially because they had to borrow Jordan as well but our debt increase was not sort of significant compared to many other countries. And I'll talk about management of debt a little bit towards it. Now it, I get to the um, sort of going forward. And, and the going forward, we started before COVID and then COVID interrupted it. So in 2018 and 19, um, the government sat together and we said, okay, uh, you know, swimming against the tide and staying alive is a fantastic thing, but the population is tired. You're tired when you're swimming, swimming against the tide. You need sort of a leapfrog of some sort. So what would it take in terms of macro policy, in terms of investments, in, in terms of labor and market, in terms of all of these sectoral policies, what would it take to help Jordan leap forward? And it mainly has to do with maintaining our macro stability, but really nudging our sectors to, towards, um, towards uh, e exports and, and uh, lowering the cost of production. So we worked on a structural reform matrix. This is like uh, our map. It's been uh, government through government. It's what, what we go by and we have all the donors, the, both the IMF and the World Bank, but also the USAID and other uh, regional and country donors sitting with us and looking at that, ma at that matrix. It has items, it has goals, objectives, measurements, and timetable. Um, and it starts, as you can, uh, with macroeconomic stability. And the most important part of that was the income tax law, which adjusted um, the, uh, the tax structure in Jordan and put more teeth uh, to deal with tax evasion. And we can talk a bit more about that if, you, if you're interested. The doing business and competitiveness, we really focused on that. Jordan moved up 29 ranks in the last doing business report, the highest country that moved uh, up, up the ranking system. And uh, we did a lot on foreign direct in, in investment and export promotion, establishing a firm 
uh, co-owned by the private sector and the public sector that helps SMEs essentially grow, climb up the ladder towards, towards exports um, and labor market reforms. Labor market is the toughest challenge Jordan faces today. We have very high unemployment amongst, amongst youth and this has been um, exacerbated uh, during the uh, last year during COVID. Especially that, so you know, our tourism and transport uh, sectors have been so heavily uh, affected, and these are two sectors that are youth-oriented. Also, female participation in our labor force is low, and this is something structural, and we're working, uh, we're working on. Uh, we worked a lot on our safety nets, um, um, re recalibrated how our um, um, uh, the national assistance fund works. It used to define poverty in a very limited way, and it, we redefined things to take into consideration uh, self-employed people, so people at home, etc., who and families that are suffering from lack of health insurance or lack of uh, ability to, to pay for tuition and things like that. So the, the, it really moved forward, and social security became a much stronger um, uh, entity through its uh, unemployment uh, scheme. And I'm very happy to say that the number of informal entities, the informal uh, uh, SMEs that were out from the umbrella, um, there used to be around 55,000 um, companies under the Social Security, and that moved up to around 85,000 just in the last year or year and a half as 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 a package deal to address COVID for the employees and give them income, but at the same time formalize them into the formal market. Um, lots of sectoral reforms on tourism, transport, energy, manufacturing, water and agribusiness, uh, et cetera. All of this has, has been uh, achieved as well as public sector governance reform. There's been a lot of changes in the laws and regulations that deal with uh, fighting corruption, civil service reform, transparency, accountability, and I can say a lot of things about that. So I will end here with the last slide about, okay, this is all national and we talked about regional, uh, but there is a, there are lots of lessons to learn on the global level, and I think a lot of the students and, and, and faculty are working on that. This is a time to really reflect about what we thought our global system uh, was and what really what it turned out to be. You know, everybody talked about free trade as a wonderful thing, and then COVID comes in, and and Western countries start hoarding uh, their vaccines, and then the question becomes, what what do we how do we deal with that? You know, maybe just in um, just in time isn't the, shouldn't be the logo. We should do just in case we should have more reservoir. Of um, and uh, and storage facilities, etc., and look at our industry. So, uh, lots of lessons to be learned um, at that level. Um, absorbing refugees as a global good, as a global public good. What is the? I have to say there was tons of support for Jordan to meet its obligations in the first two years. Everybody came through, but there is this thing called um, donor fatigue. You know, then Syrian refugees are not the, or Syria in itself is not the top item on the news. So people start moving away from that. Now that's dangerous because the refugees are still here and we're still spending on the public services that are provided. And we're happy to do that on moral grounds. But what is the le lesson to countries um, in Africa or Asia when, when there is a, a coup or a failed state or a natural disaster in the country next door. Lots of women and children at the border. Do you open and let them in or do you keep that door closed? What is the world's responsibility on this issue? And can we have a global agreement on what countries do? Because this, the last thing you want is a one or two year kind of enthusiastic and, uh, response and then donor fatigue and then the issue goes out of the, uh, the news. Again, uh, the COVID itself as a as a global public bad. Uh, can we look at the uh, logistical chain, at the IP, at the 
um, experience of um, um, uh, kind of creating a structure that which WHO I think led, but nonetheless was at, um, uh, vetoed, I guess, by the US administration back then. Um, lots of important lessons because we all know this is not the last time we're going to have an, a, a pandemic and nobody's safe, as they say, until everybody's safe. Um, climate change as a global public good. Our region uh, is going to be one of the most affected regions in South in general by uh, climate change. We lack a, you know, with all the attempts by the EU and the Paris Agreement and the G20, we still see the shortfall in, in this and the need for um, rethinking governance of, of global public goods. Um, I um, I should stop here and uh, uh, and um, listen to your questions and uh, discuss more. I'm sorry if it took uh, longer than intended. Thank you so much, Dr. Razaz, um, for these insights and for also sharing with us how you see the past decade for Jordan and how you see. Uh, today for Jordan, also for, for the region and the world. Um, so, so in this presentation, you discussed these events that took place in the world around Jordan, in Jordan over the past decade, starting with the global financial crisis and the events that came after, uh, which clearly harmed growth, put fi public finances under significant strain, uh, which then led Jordan into a fiscal consolidation program by 2017 which obviously was necessary to maintain macroeconomic stability. And then you said that by 2018, you were looking to kind of reignite growth, attract investments, et cetera. But then in 2020, uh, the COVID pandemic hit and you, you led Jordan through the first stages of, of the pandemic, which was an extraordinary shock to the economy. Um, so all these events tell us basically that Jordan and perhaps the entire region are no strangers to volatility, to shocks, uh, to, to uncertainty. Um, what, what do you see as necessary actions or priorities for Jordan and maybe the region as a whole to prepare for these future shocks and reduce vulnerability to them? You're on mute. We can't hear you. OK, let me uh, just briefly talk about Jordan, the region, and maybe uh, go back to some global issues. Uh, at the level of Jordan, we've learned, uh, and we were fortunate that we had um, um, facilities, storage facilities, and reservoirs for uh, energy, uh, oil and gas, uh, rice and uh, flour and, and all of that. And uh, it, we were fortunate that we had uh, a lot of uh, reserves of, of these things. But the lesson learned, we need to expand because when something like this happens, we've seen how, how countries operate. Um, at the same time, we focused on our pharmaceutical industry and me medical equipment and um, food products and opened the door for them to really expand to exports, but also to switch lines, uh, production lines. And for instance, the garment industry stopped producing garments and started uh, producing face masks, masks and gowns and very quickly. And we were able to meet the, the needs for countries. So you need to act very fast. Uh, our decision to lock down early on, um, with hindsight, it was the right decision. We were not sure when we took that decision because you're always weighing, okay, uh, um, life and, 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 and livelihoods. So which is more important and how do you weigh the two? There is no catalog, but what, what, what we discovered is acting quickly. Um, the third thing was, uh, just the incredible um, sort of every, everything has to be redefined basically. So uh, because of the spillover effects of everything. Uh, so Ministry of Health was not leading this effort necessarily. Uh, and because it needed everybody else, it needed the uh, 
the Ministry of Economy, it needed the Ministry of Education to, 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 to deal with that. We had the C our own CDC, the Center for Disease Control, which we gave it a lot of area and room to come and, and say, do this and do, don't do that. And we had to bring in the security forces on board to, to think about, okay, where do you open, where do you close, and how do you minimize? So lots of lessons learned. Having a center for crisis management that's equipped with everything you need, and we had that, was, was, a, was a bliss and allowed this kind of teamwork to take place even if we were sitting in different places. At a regional level, uh, it became very clear that uh, the regions, just about every region has a, a center for disease control at the regional level. In, uh, in, in our part of the world, we don't have that. And that's so important because th there are uh, features, common features in uh, virus, viral and bacterial development that are region specific. So the research and the prevention is, is very important. And at the global level, um, um, what I see now are attempts by countries to come together and, and, and deal uh, deal with this, but we we face all the collective action problems, you know, free ridership and uh, prisoners, you know, all the type prisoners dilemma, all the types of issues that come with these types of uh, uh, problems, and and it has to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, agreed. And you you mentioned when you started answering the question that. A lot of these decisions come with significant trade-offs, right? And mm -hmm. we, we we are very interested by um, your, your experience with that particular kind of uh, uh, dilemma when doing reform reform in Jordan. So I want to shift the discussion a bit to talk about uh, the lessons uh, of doing reform and the trade-offs that that come come when you're doing reform. Uh, and and to start. You came into government uh, following a, a popular backlash to a tax legislation that was put forward by, by your predecessor, which was uh, planned, studied, researched, right? Uh, but it didn't have the, the support it needed. And uh, I, I, I would imagine the moment you and your government came into office, you were under immense pressure and scrutiny since the first minute. So we're very curious about how you navigate uh, these competing priorities, right? Protecting Jordanian households while at the same time uh, delivering or achieving on the technical objective, which back then was preventing fiscal deterioration and containing the balances. Well, I'm smiling because I'm curious as well. Uh, and you always, one looks back and says, could we have done it uh, differently? If, if I had an advice to any of you, the students who are preparing yourselves to be in government, uh, try not to start your uh, uh, government period with a new tax law, okay? Uh, having said that, uh, I look back and I realize I would have I would have done it uh, again, but maybe uh, maybe somewhat differently. The issue was that uh, the Jordan tax system was broken, uh, was not uh, efficient, was not functional. There was a lot of evasion. And the bulk of tax revenues came from sales tax, from value added tax. And for those of you who work on this issue, you know that sales tax are regressive. They're not fair. You, you, you put the same, if it's 16%, you take the 16% from the rich man and you take a 16% from the poor man. So it is one of the most regressive, uh, uh, unjust forms of tax. And that was the, our biggest form of revenue. Uh, income tax, in contrast, is a progressive form of tax because it, very, it, it creates levels of income and it, it I'm sorry, it creates um, different levels of taxes depending on the level, level of income. So we, we designed it such that 80, 90% of the population would not be affected negatively by the income tax. Uh, so we were very, and we put all sorts of instruments to really make tax evasion and avoidance um, harder. Um, the problem was in the following, we wanted to explain this to people that the majority of people will not be affected and it would actually 
over time help us reduce the other the, the sales tax uh, and and change the balance between the two. But we had two problems. One, the IMF was in a hurry. We had a program that needed, so we needed it. We, uh, we, our government came in June, mid-June. By September, we had to meet that obligation. So we started to explain the issue. But I have to say, as usual with reform, you had very strong interest groups against it. Uh, the business, the large businesses, the large, uh, uh, and a lot of the professional uh, groups um, uh, who had not, who had been evading taxes in all sorts of ways, uh, uh, also uh, did that. So, um, uh, so I think the lesson learned, I I would say, governments need to take tough actions at times, um, and some of them might not be very popular, but try your best to explain uh, the what you are doing to the to the population and try not to be limited with a with a with a short time frame uh, as a result that, that gives us a lot to to ask about so I, I i do have questions about what you mentioned about communications but first i wanted to to say given that we're talking about uh, this tax reform back then uh, th that wasn't the only tough decision or situation you faced right during your time as prime minister you dealt with other situations of popular demand or pressure uh in response to certain policy decisions that you wanted to to make for example uh we know that in the uh, towards the end of 2019 uh jordan witnessed a teacher strike demanding uh, raises to to their wages while your government was arguing to tie some of these raises to performance uh Similar question, perhaps, what did you learn from, from these instances that you incorporated in your strategy or you would recommend incorporating? You're on mute as well. I reflect on this a lot as well. Uh, I was a minister of education before I became a prime minister. So I, I knew the teachers union very well. We used to have uh, regular meet, me, meetings once a month uh, 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 at least and we agreed about most things that they really we, we were all for a salary increase they had uh, very legitimate requests related to health insurance and things like that um, so and we signed agreements with them we signed two agreements with uh, uh, with the with the union the problem, Api, is where, where does the problem start? And this is with unions, some unions, not just in Jordan, but, but all over the world, is sometimes, so you, it's not just about the professional agenda uh, and the issue of the members of the union. Sometimes it takes a populist uh, kind of tenor, a populist uh, uh, that starts to, take on political issues that are outside the realm of the um, union. And that complicates things because instead of talking about salaries and benefits, you start to talking about sort of national policy and foreign policy and this and that. And they have the right to do that as citizens, definitely, but not through a union, a professional union. So that becomes one problem. The other problem, and that's where I think we were very clear is it's legitimate to raise your issues and use all the tools that you have to pressure each other to kind of get get what you want but closing of schools for extended periods of time or any public service for that matter should not be one of the tools that unions use because then if you allow that as one of the tools or one of the cards then what's next is it hospitals is it clinics is it um uh, power stations, is it, is it water services? Uh, we really, that, that was one issue. In, upon reflecting uh, on what, uh, what the outcome was, we did raise the salaries of, um, of teachers, but uh, in, in every, not only, in, we knew what the gap was 
in for teachers, but we knew for other public services as well for specialized in health and what have you. So we did a comprehensive review and we raised salaries, but we also linked it to performance. And that was that was critical because we that's that's the way uh, to go. So my I'll end with this to say there is always a possible win-win scenario as opposed to a zero sum. But sometimes we lack of knowing how to negotiate gets us into a zero sum and sometimes a a lose-lose um, scenario, which is which is unfortunate. Thank you. Uh, to kind of continue on on this last point you you made about negotiating uh, and also what you said earlier about um, explaining to people the, the value of reform. Uh, what role do you think communication and dialogue could play in, in increasing the effectiveness and success chances of a reform? Uh, and if you have any examples of successful or maybe failed reforms which succeeded or failed based on the communication strategy, we'd be very happy to hear. Uh, well, I think the best reference on that uh, academic reference is Professor Heifetz's work on how important it is to uh, engage in adaptive leadership as opposed to technical. Uh, and um, I'll just compare the story I told about income tax reform and how little time we had to explain uh, why we're doing it. And it gave uh, it sort of put us in a, in a weak spot vis-a-vis -vis, uh, interest groups that were simply trying to protect, uh, the, you know, avoid their losses um, in this. Uh, if I can bring up the example I've had in Social Security, as you mentioned in the introduction, I headed Social Security for four, for four years in Jordan. And on my first day, I looked at the actuarial study by the ILO and it said that was 2007 and that study said in 2017 the social security will start bleeding severely and you know will start um, losing its capital and its ability to cover its retirees over time and uh, I looked at that and I said okay we have to do something and I briefed the government and I etc and uh, but I, I couldn't convince neither the unions nor the private sector nor the government that were on, on the board of Social Security of the need to change. Uh, now, in a, in a nutshell, the old system, you, at the age of 45, you could retire, get 80% of your previous salary, essentially, and then go back and work again. Uh, so if you look at it, even, you know, you don't need an actuarial study that shows you that the system cannot be sustained because there, it, there is much more money going out than money going in. Uh, but when I faced that resistance, I realized that, and this applied to my work in the World Bank before and, and later, with, that we often, technocrats, tend to um, immediately come up with a solution and start trying to sell the solution before people understand that there is a problem to begin with. And I, so we had to go back to square one and I invited the unions one by one and we, I went out to the, every part of Jordan explaining just what the problem is, why the current scenario is not sustainable and why is it if we continue as such You'll get your your pension now until you're maybe 60 or 65, but there might not be money uh, beyond. Once everybody was on the same page in defining the problem, the process changed completely. So we were discussing solutions: do we do we increase age or do we increase power? So, and we uh, ability to listen we uh, to to uh, members. We added two new parameters or two new insurances. One was maternity benefits uh, for pregnant women and, was un and the other was unemployment insurance, which served us tremendously later during COVID. So we came up with something that was not anybody's first choice, but we came up with somebody that something that achieved most of our obje of the objectives of the, of the party. So this was a, this took two, three years. 
but it put social security on a sustainable path. Vast difference between that and what happened with income tax. It, during COVID and going forward, we relied a lot in government on the Economic and Social Council, which again was a platform that brought civil society, the private sector, the unions and the public sector to discuss all sorts of things. Thank you. Um, with that, I will shift the conversation a bit to talk about the international development field and the role it, it plays. Uh, my first question on that is, you, you personally had a long career in, in public policy before being appointed uh, the prime minister. So you, you worked in the World Bank as the country manager for Lebanon, you directed the uh, Jordan Strategy Forum. So you, you had spent uh, a lot of time thinking about the challenges facing uh, Jordan and the region before, uh, for quite some time before you took a leadership role in the government. Um, how has this career in these different institutions prepared you to be a prime minister? And what were some of the unseen or unexpected challenges? Uh... As you said, Farah, my experience in academia, international organizations, and in Jordan Strategy Forum and, uh, was mostly about public policy uh, in various sectors, the macro, the micro, the fiscal, the health, the education, the social security. Uh, but what it wasn't in politics, per se, uh, as much. In, in Arabic, the word for politics is siyasa, and the word for policy is siyasa. It's the same word. But I discovered just how different they, they, these are. Because if you come with my background, kind of thinking about structural change and things that will uh, yield uh, value and benefits five years down the road or 20 years down the road, etc. That's from a policy perspective. So you're creating the structural transformations, changing laws, etc. While the crude politics, if you will, and I'm saying crude, not all politics is like that, is very different. It's sort of horse trading, uh, kind of appeasement, uh, finding... Uh, uh, you know, wanting to cut ribbons every day, every day, etc. Very short termist, um, and, and that has to do with the horizon uh, of that. So, uh, if you're coming to those of you who are coming from a public policy uh, background, prepare yourself for a bit of a shock in dealing with sort of uh, politics, uh, with all its the kind of the bad aspects of it, but also the the good aspects, the good aspects of it actually um, have to do with one communication. And I think, you know, if I can stress the th three things that a politician should do more of, or a policy person is really explain and listen and explain and listen and really listen, not just kind of really listen and see what is it that bo is bothering people really about this? Is it, and is there something we can do about it? Um, I can't emphasize that uh, enough. The other aspect uh, that somebody who comes from academia or research um, um, sort of into office is um, maybe I can stereotype things a little bit. Some of us are idealists and, you know, and. And for those, it's very, very hard to go into politics uh, because you know you. It's all about uh, you know the uh, po politics is the art of the possible in a sense. So, uh, but but I think it's important for idealists to enter uh, into politics because otherwise it's just pragmatists who are saying okay anything works and then you know okay whatever works works. So there is a combination of having your own, keeping your own ideals awake in a sense, but realizing that this process is about finding common grounds and choosing your battles. You can't open all, all fronts all at the same time. So how do you choose your battles? How do you understand who your allies and how do you mitigate uh, the effect of those who are against you? Maybe because either they don't understand or their interests they, they they sort of they lose as a as a result of this reform, so um, so in a sense you're you're trying to be a realist, 
between pragmatism and idealism. You want to hold to your ideal values. You want to see what can be done, but you don't want to give up your ideals and become somebody who's just sort of operates, man, sort of maneuvers and operates things and pushes problems um, to the front. So <laughs> my two cents worth. Thank you. That was uh, super enlightening. Um, to, to stay on the same uh, maybe topic, uh, the, the IMF and the World Bank are very super important partners, right, to every country during its development process. Um, you personally have been on both sides of the table. So you were a member of the World Bank, and later you you worked you were the Director General of the Social Security, Prime, uh, Minister of Education, and Prime Minister. Um, how, how do you see, given these like different sites that you, you sat on, how do you see the role of these institutions in countries like Jordan, particularly mm -hmm. in supporting the country in addressing uh, the, the trade-offs that come with reform? Uh, and, and whether you think there are any changes to their approach that is necessary to mm -hmm. increase their effectiveness and make sure that the impact they have is sustained? Uh, okay, let me start by saying, and having been on both sides uh, of the aisle, if you will, um, there is no lot lost uh, by countries and populations of the world to uh, the World Bank and IMF. And that is to be expected, actually, because um, when do we call on these institutions? When we're in trouble. So in a sense, they're a bit like the hospital or the, the doctor who comes in and sometimes administers bitter pills. Uh, so there is an association by the population of, of, of these on, uh, institutions with the hardship that we go to. In fact, very often they're only invited when, when countries face problems. But countries don't, that are growing and don't have monetary and fiscal problems don't need the World Bank and IMF. Having said that, uh, I've seen very bad relationships and very good relationships and very good use of the facilities that are available at, at the World Bank and the IMF. And I'm, I've seen very bad use of these resources. Um, one, I've sometimes, uh, it, if a country formulates very strongly and diagnoses its problem and says, okay, here's what, here is, what happened? Here is our problem. Here is how we're going to solve it. We need IMF support on the short term and uh, with the facility to address our fiscal uh, issues. And we need maybe World Bank support in um, the energy sector, the water sector, maybe the health sector, etc. That's what we need. This is the best kind of relationship. When the country defines the agenda, uh, there are other scenarios where uh, these institutions are invited and the country is either divided or doesn't, you know, just kind of puts out the problems on the table but does not offer the solutions. And then when the World Bank or the IMF say, okay, why don't you do X, Y, and Z, they go to their population and they say, the World Bank told us to do that or the IMF told us to do that. Uh, countries are sovereign entities and they need to be responsible for their actions. If they don't believe in something that they're doing, they should tell the po their population and these institutions that we don't believe in, in, in these actions. So it is important to have uh, sort of uh, effective institutions in government that diagnose and put solutions and engage in the kind of dialogue that we were talking about with their own population. Um, and I have a lot of respect for countries that say, this is our program, not the IMF's program, not the World Bank. This is our program because we believe in it and here are the benefits of it. Thank you for that. Uh, a last question from me, Dr. Razaz, before we open up for questions from the Growth Lab team and the audience. Uh, it is slightly different than what we've been discussing, but we couldn't let you go without uh, getting your thoughts on, on some of the issues that we know are important for Jordan and for the region. Uh, so the question is, we know that Middle Eastern countries register the highest levels of youth unemployment in the world, 
Um, and this reality, it coexists with very low levels of participation. Uh, we'd like to know how, how do you think about this problem and what you think is possibly a step in the right direction on this agenda? Uh, Farah, this is the biggest problem that Jordan faces and many countries in the region, especially with youth. And it's an inheritance from a, if I can use the term, a rentier era in the Arab world where you know, we had lots of natural resources and we spent them and we hired people in the public sector. And that was sort of the social contract. We hire you in the public sector, we give you education and health, and that's all there is that you, you, you should ask for. Don't ask for anything else. Now, that's drying up, definitely for Jordan. Now, we, we never had natural oil uh, to begin with, but we had a lot of external aid that has now dried up completely. So you have a bloated public sector, a smaller private sector, and very low female participation and youth participation, low uh, job creation. In Jordan, there is a particular problem, which has been that the private sector, especially in agriculture, construction, and some of the more traditional transport and things like that, relied on cheap foreign labor. Uh, uh, so we have foreign labor is almost, in Jordan is about a million uh, workers, about twice or three times the number of unemployed Jordanians. But it's not that Jordanians can replace them because we've gotten ourselves into a vicious cycle, low wage, low uh, capital, low productivity, low quality, kind of in the agricultural sector and in the construction sector. So one problem is the demand side. Our private sector needs to grow and gets weaned off the idea that it can hire uh, foreign workers and not give them the proper treatment as per the law and pay social security and all these expenses for them. So at least to create equilibrium between them and their Jordanian counterparts. Um, on, the, on the supply side, our youth have gotten more used, I'd say, to the idea that no, you're not going to find a job in the public sector where you can sit behind a desk and smoke a cigarette. Uh, you need to go and you need to acquire the skills necessary for what the market demands. So we started working on a school to work transition program. Unfortunately, most of our schools and universities don't prepare students for the uh, for the labor market. They just thrown out with your degree and don't have the right skills. So there is a program that we're working on to reskilling, re upskilling and helping students and help uh, female participation in the labor force, but also um, all the self-employment. We had rigid self-employment mechanisms that we're working on and allowing people to participate in social security, even on part-time basis or home-based. Uh, so, uh, but that remains the toughest challenge because the gap between those entering the labor market and the jobs created by the labor market, the gap is huge. And it'll take, it, we need to be clear that it'll take five years to a decade to really bring that, uh, close that gap. Thank you so much, Dr. Razas, for, for answering all these questions. Um, Thank you. Yes, we, we'll, we'll start with, with, with questions from the Growth Lab team. And uh, the Growth Lab director, Dr. Ricardo Hausman, is here uh, to, to ask some questions. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Razas, what a pleasure to have you with us, to listen to you, to listen to your wisdom. It's so good to see you. It was great to meet you when you were prime minister and, and to work with you. I have, I have two questions um, for you. Um, the first one is you mentioned, uh, you know, voice and accountability. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, all, all the problems with, with reforms. I, I wanted to ask uh, to you if there was more voice and accountability in Jordan which are the voices that uh, are currently underrepresented and which are the voices that are currently overrepresented? 
and maybe among the voices that are very significantly presented are the voices of of the aid community that uh, of the aid our aid, aid. aid community right that um, so so I, I was wondering um you mentioned Tunisia as a case in which you know voice and accountability went up but uh, the equilibrium was less stable um so so I, I was just just uh, your thoughts on on you know a move towards more voice and accountability what voices would be heard and what what uh, of the current voices that are being heard you know uh, which ones would would be pared down um, and 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 the second question is a more an advice uh, from you to us um, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about the IMF, the World Bank, etc. You know, an organization like us, the Growth Lab, uh, what can we do to add value to what we do, or, or you know, how can how should we approach our our work? You know, having had the experience of of working with us. Let me stop there. Uh, Ricardo, very good to see you. Uh, it, the Growth Lab has been amazing uh, in helping us uh, think through scenarios. It's always, I think also it's it's uh, Professor Heifetz who talks about the importance of looking at the problem from the balcony, I guess the way he, he sort of, and, and we don't have the luxury of looking at things sometimes from a distance, from a bird's eye view. This is exactly what you and your team have provided. And in fact, you've pointed us to a few problems down coming down the road that we hadn't even paid attention to. Uh, and we didn't realize what the scale of until you kind of pointed and said, okay, look at that. Uh, so it's very important to have that type of um, uh, sort of professional, not vested uh, a, a think tank that helps us look at policy options. It's exactly uh, scenario setting and looking at the experience of other countries and looking at the specificities. Um, in a sense, we've had locally, we were relying a lot on, this, uh, on the ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council, to help us with that, but we did lack to a large extent, a the kind of the think tank aspect, the kind of the rigorous um, analytic analytics uh, that that go with that. So I think my advice, I'm I'm going backwards. My advice would be um, to um, look at the matrix, our five year matrix that we have developed, and. Um, and help us make sure that we've got everything covered. Did we, do we have a blind spot somewhere to something that's coming down the road? We all are seeing the pace of development, the, the sort of uh, 21st century jobs, the fourth industrial revolution, the, how that's changing the labor market, what kind of things we need to be focusing on in our universities. Uh, all of that, we can be myopic sometimes um, and, and not see what's happening around us in the, in the world and not be able to explain it well uh, to the public. So I think you can help us both with, with that early kind of uh, warning signals um, and also with dealing with things we're already uh, facing but need better policies and implications. Now, uh, the hardest, the harder question is your first question, and I deferred it to last so that I can think about it a little bit. Um, <laughs> voice and accountability, if we had more, uh, what would differ? I think, relatively speaking, Jordan's problem is not so much in voice, although there's always more voice that needs to, to, to be heard uh, from the governorates, from outside Amman, uh, from um, um, lower income groups, those who are not getting quality services, quality education, quality healthcare systems, um, um, and uh, quality services. And therefore, you fall into the uh, vicious cycle of poverty and 
you, you might have your sons and daughters graduate from high school or even go to uh, university, but still not be able to, to break the poverty cycle. So, um, so there is an element of voice, but I have to say, and for those who don't know, we, Jordan, we, in Jordan, we do have a parliament that is uh, widely representative. It, uh, a lot of the parliamentarians come from uh, the governorates and from remote areas. Uh, so it's not that I worry about, it's the accountability. I think on voice, we can make some improvements, but on accountability, we need to make a lot of improvements. And that's partly, I think, uh, King Abdullah has formed a committee and, um, and asked them to start working towards a, a governments that are parliamentary elected governments so that you have better accountability uh, structures going forward. Um, we tried during my government to make ourselves accountable, even though, uh, so, so uh, by putting very clear objectives for the year and, and, and indicators on a quarterly basis, and also to create mechanisms for feedback. So uh, people who are not getting the services they expect could go online and, and put in a, a claim. And then we created the mechanism for them to get an immediate response and for somebody to follow their case, et cetera, et cetera. But this was all really putting together, in my view, the uh, early elements of accountability um, so that people themselves can judge whether this government is doing what it needs to do, uh, some ways to go. And here are accountability structures, but I'd have to say we all know that this transition process isn't easy and you have to manage it quite well. Thank you. We can wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Rezas, for being with us. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. And apologies for those who asked questions in the Q&A, but we didn't have uh, the time to, to, get, to get to those. Uh, Dr. Rezas, if you have any final remarks before we wrap up. Uh, Farah and uh, 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 Ricardo and Harvard, thank you so, so much for this opportunity. And I do see that there are a number of Q&As that, uh, uh, that are on my screen, and I would be more than happy to, uh, to address them after uh, the session. So, but this was a, a great opportunity, and you asked real tough questions that uh, forced me to think a lot and maybe to reflect even more on on issues we're facing. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, you're most welcome in, in, in Jordan anytime. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity and for, for sharing the insights with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, OK, thank you, everyone. And we really look forward to seeing you on the 11th of August for our next Development Talk seminar. Have a great day. Thank you.